to talk tonight about some verses in one of the richest portions of Scripture there is. Of course, I'll tell you that every time we go into a portion of Scripture, that it's the richest and the best. But right now, from where I stand in the Lord, there's nothing richer than the epistle to the Philippians. The epistle to the Philippians has to do with the ongoing believer. It, it has to do with the believer who has caught vision of who God made him to be, and he wants to become that. So we've dealt with the first chapter already, and we're going to talk about the second chapter of Philippians. And I just believe the Lord has something to say to each, each one of you that you've not heard before. He's probably said it, but you just didn't hear it. So let's believe that the Lord is going to take us into an understanding and a way of seeing and understanding that's new and fresh and will just captivate us and just bless us and lead us on in the Lord. We live in an hour when God is revealing his word as never before. Somebody says, well, uh, you can't depend on that because uh, everybody's different. Yes, everybody's different, but we have the same teacher. The teacher is the Holy Spirit. The reason why the teaching of the Holy Spirit doesn't come out of all of us the same because he comes out a Baptist like a Baptist, a Methodist like a Methodist, a Catholic like a Catholic, and a Charismatic like a Charismatic. Why doesn't he come out of all of us the same? Because we're all different. God created us differently. No two of us alike. Well, that would make you think that the gospel would never be stable. It'd never be completely understood. Uh, that's what the world sees in Christianity right now. They see in the man-made part of Christianity that it's all different. There are 360 different brands of Baptist alone listed in the encyclopedia. So the, these are all different one way or another because they don't, they're not one. They're all different. And no telling how many other groups there is in any name, religious, institutional name that you could, that you could give. So it's very obvious from man's viewpoint we're never going to have a message or a gospel that's the same going to always be different. But from God's viewpoint, he's working every one of us by the Holy Spirit to an understanding that is the same. He's revealing Christ. Now, the Christ he reveals is seen to us different, dependent upon our creation. But the Christ he reveals is the same to every one of us. It's different to us, but it's the same to him. And you know what? The longer the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to you or to anybody else, the more we come together in unity and union. Remember that now. I run into Catholics who see Christ as their life. I could have never gotten together with them on any other basis of fellowship, but they see Christ as life. I used to say we could get together with people on the basis of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And then I saw a whole lot of people receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit that was entirely different than what I thought it ought to be. But you can't have a difference in Christ. We have a difference in the works of the Holy Spirit because he's spirit and is not, uh, he hasn't become tangible as Christ was. We're going to talk about how Christ and his tangibility operated tonight in the second chapter of Philippians. But the Holy Spirit's never been given uh, embodiment. He's spirit. But Christ was given embodiment. He was all God and he was all man in a sense. And so we see him and understand him as man. And we hear what he says so we know, every one of us know. When he sat down to eat, we all know what that meant. Whether you're Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Pentecostal, you know what that meant. He said words. We all know what that means. So Paul said... When we see Jesus, we come into unity. It's seeing Christ. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is the ability to see Christ because Jesus said when the Holy Spirit has come, he will take the things of mine and reveal them unto you. So we're not going to all come to the same interpretation of scriptures, but when we see Jesus, the Holy Spirit is going to work it so that all of us see the same Christ that's the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Now, why is it everybody that believes in Jesus Christ doesn't see the same Christ today? Because they haven't had a revelation of Jesus Christ. What's the key to the plan of God? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul prayed seven prayers, main prayers. Every one of these prayers were for us to come to know Jesus in a greater way. 
that you might know the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of what is yours in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul was given to this message of knowing Christ. And so that's where we are in our walk with God. We are beginning to know and learn Christ. And no place do we do that in any greater sense than in the epistle to the Philippians and particularly in this second chapter. So let's look at these verses. I'm going to go through these verses slowly and try to cover what I think to be the message the Lord would have us to uh, see here tonight. In the very first verse he says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, now there's an in Christ statement. Always when you come across that prepositional phrase, in Christ, mark it. There are over 200 of them in your New Testament. That's the strongest message in the New Testament. It's stronger than Calvary. It's stronger than Pentecost. It's stronger than faith. It's stronger than love. That's why I like to have you mark it. So when you come across that statement, like in the first line of this first verse of chapter 2 of Philippians, mark it. It says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ. So let's just digress for a moment. God does not have anything for the human being that's not in Christ. Now notice, notice what he says is in Christ now. He says if there's any consolation, if there is any blessing, if there is any reward, if there's anything you get from God, it's in Christ. Now you see, that's pretty strong, isn't it? That's why that's the strongest statement in the New Testament, the most often used statement. That means it isn't in Abraham. That means you can study Abraham and David and Isaiah and Daniel and never get your full blessing. Because he says, if there is any blessing or consolation or reward for serving God, it's in Christ. Now, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? You know what? Most of us have been raised in churches that never taught that, that it was all in Christ. Never was seen. I preached 13 years in the highest places in my denomination and never did see that. And never did hear anybody else talk about it. But the whole of what God has for the human being is in Christ. But let's not just stay on that first line. Therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy. Well, now we are seeing from Paul's talk here that there are at least three powerful things that are in Christ. At least three powerful things are in Christ. First in Christ is comfort of love. The comfort of love. That's in Christ. A believer who knows that he's in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, and the right translation of that is, if any man knows, that's what the if is, if any man knows that he's in Christ. Because you see, all believers are in Christ. But if he doesn't know he's in Christ, he never becomes the one who is blessed by being in Christ. You can live your lifetime and be in Christ and never know it. Therefore, if any man knows that he's in Christ, then he has these three signal blessings. He has many more, but there are three listed in this first verse. First, he has comfort of love. If a man knows that he's in Christ, he has the comfort of love. What does that mean? That means your knowledge that you're in Christ says to you in your darkest moment, in the deepest pit you fall into, in the hardest times you come to, you are comforted by God's love. I'm cared for. A lady got, told me a few days ago that she was so destitute, she was so lonely, she said, I am at a point I would take my life if I had the guts. She was a believer. But she didn't know she was in Christ, so she had no comfort of love. She was in a hard place. She was at a difficult moment of life. She had the fire raging. She had the fiery darts of Satan coming at her. She had everything falling apart that gave her security. But she didn't know she was in Christ, so she had no comfort of love. What is it you need in your darkest hour? You need love. 
something to hang on to, something to hold on to, somebody that loves you and cares for you. You know the way we've been raised? When it gets dark, we think God is gone. The light is out. We've been raised in religion that has told us that when things get hard and bad, the devil is stronger than God. We've been lied to. That's not the truth. The truth is that we have comfort of love if we know we're in Christ. What does love do for us? It gives us that comfort we need. Keeps us from being raging maniacs. Keeps us from getting angry and mad. Keeps us from leaving God and our security we have in Christ and hold fast in our faith to who and what we are. Comfort of love. That's the first thing this verse says that we have in Christ. The second thing he says is fellowship of the Spirit. Now, I guess I could talk all night long about this because that's one of my favorite subjects. Fellowship of the Spirit means the Holy Spirit is doing something. What is he doing? He's given us fellowship. He's come to us in a bad time, and he's telling us who and what we are in Christ. You have that blessing in Christ. When you know that you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit will come and tell you that. You get bad news at one moment. The Holy Spirit says, you're in Christ. I'm right here. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to direct you. I'm going to help you. You're not alone in this. You have fellowship with the Holy Spirit in Christ. Never leaves you. He never forsakes you. Just like Christ never leaves you nor forsakes you. Neither does the Holy Spirit ever leave you. Once you have accepted Jesus, even before you accepted Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit working with you. His whole theme and purpose is to make you aware of Jesus because God knew that you didn't have enough sense to believe another person lived in you, that you'd have troubles and trials that would just make you think you're in a little boat all by yourself being carried by the waves to the bottom. God knew that. So he said, I'm going to give you a part of myself called the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's going to ever remind you that Christ is in you, that you're never alone. That you're never really yourself. You're always a potential Christ in human form because that's what the Holy Spirit's going to reveal to you, Christ, who is in you. So we have fellowship of the Spirit because we're in Christ. And then there's a third thing this verse says. This third verse says that we have bowels and mercies. The word bowels means compassion. Did you ever hurt to the core of your being? over something that was wrong, something that was lacking, somebody in need, yourself in need, your loved one in need, your children. That's what the scripture calls bowels. It means compassion. In Christ, we have compassion and mercies. We first have Christ's compassion. That's what it means to be in Christ. You have his compassion working. What does that mean? Nobody loves you like he loves you. Nobody cares for you like he cares for you. When you're in a jam, you know what Jesus would like to do? He'd like to tell you how much he cares, how much he loves you. Even when you're wrong, you failed or sinned, Jesus would like to tell you you're wrong. But your mindset has always been, I'm in this mess because I did wrong. I'm in this mess because I failed God. And you serve out of guilt instead of out of faith that Christ in you loves you and cares for you. You know what jerks me back on the straight and narrow? It's his love for me. Sure, I fail. Sure, I fall short. Sure, I got sins of the flesh. But what jerks me back is this love he has for me. That's his bowel. That's what bowels means. Compassion and mercy. Now you have that in Christ. You see, that's a liberty that religion keeps us from. Because religion says you're in trouble, and if you don't straighten up, you're going to get in worse trouble. When the Christ in you is crying out how much he loves you, what's his love based on? The fact that you're going to do good? You may not. The fact that you're a worthy person, you are not. What's his love based on? The sacrifice he made in your behalf at Calvary. He says, I paid the price. 
I know you and I are in a jam right now because I'm in it with you. But I love you. And I have mercy on you. Mercy and compassion. Now that's our consolation in Christ. If there be any consolation in Christ, it is comfort of love, it is fellowship of the Spirit, it is compassion and mercy. But look at the second verse. Fulfill ye my joy, that you may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Now, verse 2 has another trilogy to it. You hear what it's saying? He says, Fulfill ye my joy, that you may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Whose joy are we seeing here? We're seeing the Apostle Paul's joy. I'm amazed at how many times Paul looked at people and said, I've given you truth, I've given you life, I've given you the word, and you haven't taken hold of it. You just haven't taken hold of it. I think his strongest statement in that area is over in uh, Galatians, the first chapter, where he says that, uh, I, where he says, I'm amazed that you have turned from the gospel which I gave you my gospel unto another gospel. What made a man say this? I think I understand his feeling. I'm careful not to say it of myself because I wouldn't compare myself to the least with the Apostle Paul. But I've had this same feeling. I know what he felt. He had given to the world a message about Christ that God had hidden from the world for 4,300 years that there wasn't one soul in the Old Testament that knew this. And Jesus, when he came, did not preach it in his fullness, saying the time has not yet come. The time only came to bring this unbelievable message that another person lived in the human being to make the human being a complete person when the Apostle Paul was raised up by God. So you see, he had a certain feeling that when I preach and teach to you, I want to be understood. I want somebody to know that I'm bringing to you a message that has not been brought before. In each of the epistles, I think, but one or two of them, he says, this is a message for the Gentiles. I have been raised up by God to bring this message to the Gentiles. And prior to that time, the whole of God's word, at least for the past 1,700 years, had been directed toward Israel, Jews. Now he said, I've got the message that completes Gentiles. And so when he talked to people, he'd use such statements as, you'll fulfill my joy if you do this. Because I've given my life to this message. One day they chopped his head off. He gave his life for that message. And he said, my joy is in bringing you this kind of message. Just like he said back in Galatians 1, that if any man preach any other gospel to you other than this one that I preach to you, let him be accursed. He believed in his gospel. I believe in this gospel. And you know what? The, I'm like Paul in this sense. The greatest joy I have is seeing someone take hold of this message in Christ. If it's the number one teaching in the word of God, and if we have been denied it in our generation, if it has only been restored now, you can imagine the great joy I have in seeing somebody accept it. I know what Paul felt there. And that's why I get a little angry. I'm back in Galatians 1 with him. I get a little angry that if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which I preach, let him be accursed. I get angry, just like I think Paul may have gotten at, at this point because he said, once you hear this, why in the world would you want anything else? Now he says in this, in this verse, this second verse, Fulfill ye my joy. And he says there are three things that give me joy. Three important things that give me joy. First, he says, joy comes from you being like-minded. One mind. The latter line, he says, one mind. Like-minded, one mind. 
The joy of the Lord for God's servants is the recipients of that gospel coming to one mind. Now, I've already stressed in talking with you here this time that we are all different, and we're going to be slow coming to see the same things because we are different. And I respect that in people. I don't expect people to hear what I say and agree with me, not entirely, not all the time. I expect the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. I expect them to be drawn by the Spirit to understand it. And when I say something that's contrary to what you think, that's because that's the way I'm being led, because that's the way I am. I may come to a different understanding. Somebody said to me the other day, I got one of your old books, not anything like you're saying today. I said, that's good news and bad news. I said, the good news is I'm growing, and I'm not saying the same thing I did 20 or 30 years ago. But the bad news is that too many people are latched on to what I used to say instead of what it is the Spirit is saying today. That's why the believer never wants to get stereotyped in religion. That's why you don't want to get boxed in with somebody's doctrine because that's what human doctrine does. It boxes you in so that you can't go outside that box for any other good news. You're locked in. So you want to always stay open. And as long as you meet with me in this room, I'll drive you to staying open. Not just to me, but open to the Holy Spirit because he's got a lot more to tell us than we know. He's got a lot more to tell us than theologians know. He's got a lot more to tell us than any preachers know. And you have a right to hear it. Amen. I used to get angry uh, because these things were in existence and nobody told me about I got angry at my college teachers. I got angry from those who taught me the word. Why didn't they teach me this? And then the Holy Spirit said, sweeten up. They've got to learn too. But I got a little angry. Well, that's all right. I didn't, I didn't cause any trouble. I didn't hit anybody. And I finally turned the anger into love. But you see, a lot of people don't know. So the joy comes from us finally coming into one mind. Now, there's a scripture that says that we will all come to the same understanding. I'm not for sure that's going to be in this body you're in now. But I got good news that one of these days we're going to all see things alike. You ever have an argument with a relative? You know, most people going with God have stopped going to family reunions. because it's too much of a knockdown drag out. So they just stay away because Aunt Susie just says they're of the devil, they're in a cult, not going to mess with them. And somebody else wants to argue over an unimportant point and so finally say, well, I hate to go, I lose, I lose my spirit. We used to say religion, but that would be good if you could lose your religion, <laughs> if you could lose your religion. But... Uh, we're never going to all be in the same mind and have the same understanding. But we will on the resurrection morning when we exchange these bodies. When this corruptible body puts on incorruption, it's going to do something marvelous to our mind because the body we have now has constant pulls toward our mind saying, if you don't do this or that, you won't be you. You won't be a true you. You, you won't have the right identity. But on the resurrection morning, you're going to get a new body that's going to stop those pulls and the, these negative pulls, and you're going to have positive pulls that fit your spirit. They'll fit Christ in you, and suddenly your mind is just going to explode. It'll know and see everything as it should be. For instance, we have two or three scriptures that say that when we see Jesus, Paul said, we shall be changed, for we shall see him as he is, and what that means, we will see him as he is in us on the resurrection morning. Well, that's like-mindedness. All of a sudden, we're alike in that sense. We have the same mind. When we get to the Father's house, the predominant factor is going to be fatherhood. Isn't that interesting? It's going to be fatherhood because that was the power that started the whole program. God is a lover. God is love. And all he ever wanted was lovers, somebody to love him. And so the father is going to have children who love him when we get to his house. 
The second important factor is going to be the lamb. Because every time the father opens his mouth, if I can proverbially speak of God, every time he opens his mouth, he's going to talk about his lamb. Because that's the way he got the sons. That's the way he got the lovers. You read the book of Revelation. I think 13 times in the book of Revelation, Jesus is called lamb. He's not called a healer. He's not called a miracle worker. He's only called, I think, four or five names otherwise. King of Kings one time. He's only called four or five names, if I remember correctly, in the book of Revelation throughout eternity by any other name. But the name God used all the time was lamb. The lamb. His lamb. His lamb. Well, that's what's going to happen on the resurrection morning. That's the second big thing. And then the third thing you're going to see is that you always had the likeness to Christ's spirit in you and didn't know it or knew it and couldn't operate it properly because you had a flesh body. You're going to come to all that knowledge in an instant on the resurrection morning when we see Jesus we shall be changed and we shall be like him. Now, what's love today? What is our love affair today? Catching a vision of that and saying, by the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to be everything Christ can be in me now because I love God. I love God. Second thing this verse says is love. It says, fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, having the same love. The same love. Now, you know something? You never considered you had the same love that Christ has. But the only true love you have is Christ's love. You really don't have any love of your own. You thought you had love of your own, but you've never really had love of your own. Why? God is love. Love is God. It's a spirit thing. It's a supernatural thing. Love has to do with God. Now that you're rebirth, the love that you have is the love of God. I don't, know, I don't remember where the verse is, but there's a verse that says that the Holy Spirit will shed abroad or spread abroad in our hearts, what? The love of God. What is the love you have then? It's the love of God. It's the love of God. Now, every time you stop loving somebody the same, it is an obvious sign it wasn't the love of God. Any true mother never stops loving her children, whatever happens to them. Parents are being tested to the limit these days over their children. Got to keep loving them. I've seen children raised in Christian's homes in the last 10 years or so that have done the most unbelievable, wicked things because of the world they live in. But I've seen godly parents love them. Sometimes it straightens them out. Sometimes it doesn't. But the only love you got is the love of God. You got no love of your own. <laughs> I had the Holy Spirit tell me that one time. I was trying to love some people in the church that were hard to love, and so I asked the Lord to give me some love, and the Holy Spirit said, the Lord doesn't have any more love to give you. I said, how come? He is love. I said, well, he's in you. You got all the love you can handle. Do it. See, I wanted the Lord to give me something special so I'd have a good reason to love these unlovable people. But the Holy Spirit said, the love is already in you. It's in you. It's in you now. Fulfill you my joy because you have love. But the third thing he says in this second verse is, Fulfill you my joy, being of one accord. Being of one accord. <clears throat> now, I'm no fool. I've been in the Lord's work a long time. And you know what? The most impossible thing I've ever found is getting people in one accord. All of them. Sometimes I felt like I had most of them in one accord. Sometimes I've even been deceived thinking I had all of them in one accord. 
only to move on that premise and then have somebody to shake it up real good when I found out they wasn't in one accord, just said they were, looked like they were, I thought they were. But Paul said, I have joy. You fulfill my joy when you're in one accord. You know how we get in one accord? By seeing Jesus. The reason people are not in one accord with each other is because people are not in one accord with themselves. And I know I beat this drum pretty hard, but you've got to see it. Human beings can't get along with each other till they can get along with themselves. They can't love each other until they love themselves. They can't know how to function with others until they know who they are. They can't have relationship with others until they're sure of their identity. I have to tell you that I believe 95% of human beings are going to live and die and never be sure of their identity, that is, who they are. They're going to have a name. They're going to do things. They're going to have a family. They're going to birth, live, and die but they're never going to know who they are because the scriptures say that we only become completed human beings by Christ in us. See, you can't get away from this in Christ thing. And most people are not going to know that. Then you say, why in the world does God carry on then if they don't know that? Because he's full of grace. Then why don't he force it on them? Why don't he make them all come to that knowledge? Why doesn't he make every preacher that claims to be ordained to preach nothing but in Christ? It's simple. The in Christ part, where Christ is all, is the intricate part of the love affair. What has he wanted? He wanted love. He didn't want robots. He could make us do anything. But love doesn't fit robots. Real love can't be forced. It's got to come spontaneously. So what God do? He said that when you get together with the Christ that's in you, one accord, or the term the scripture uses is union. The Greek uses the word union. Out of the over 200 times that the term in Christ is used in the scripture, 146 of those times translates from the Greek union. Those are the statements Paul made. It means oneness, it means we're one with Christ that's in us. That means that until the human being becomes one with the Christ that is in him, he's still not the human being he was created to be. So he can live and die like that. All unconverted people are going to live and die and never become who they're supposed to. I can show you in the world, people, by, the, by great numbers who live and die and never become their potential. Famous people who never become their potential. They've got some problem. You ever wonder why somebody that, that had money to do anything they wanted to became an alcoholic? They're an incompleted human beings. Why is it great singers become drug addicts? They're incompleted human beings. Why is it they take their life, commit suicide? Many famous people commit suicide. Why? They're incompleted human beings. Well, you see, we look at the world and see that. But did you know that it's the same in religion? It's the same in Christianity. That multitudes of people who don't know Christ is in them have Christ in them. He's been birthed there. They're born again. But they never come to know what that means. So they're unfulfilled humans. Therefore, Paul said, there's really no difference between the born again and the Gentiles without Christ. For he said to the church, where was it, at Ephesus, that you're just like the rest of the Gentiles. What, why, why? They didn't know Christ was in them. So you, you come to one accord with yourself. You've got to get it fixed who you are to yourself. You've got to watch Christ operation through you. You don't read the scriptures to find out about Jesus. You've got to watch by the work of the Holy Spirit, the Christ that's already in you and how he works out of you. Now the scriptures help to give you a mind for that. 
But you got to know about the Christ that's in you and become one with him because he fits your creation. You're different than any other person God ever created, but Christ fulfills that creation, and you have to know that before you ever know who you are. That's what a Christian is. That's what Paul's whole message was about. One accord. You get in one accord with yourself. A lady told me the other day up in New England, she said, I went to church. My family wanted me to go to church. My kids like to go to church there. She said, I went to church there. But she said that preacher began co-mingling in his message, twisting things around. And she said, I couldn't take it anymore. She said, I got up and walked out. Said, I made my family mad. They won't know why a good Christian couldn't take that even if we didn't agree. And she said, I have been so long twisted in my mind. I'm trying to get my mind straightened out and find out who I am and said I caught myself being jerked right back into what I was before and she said I love him too much to tolerate that anymore. She said I wouldn't hurt anybody and said the preacher had good things to say but said the co-mingling was more than my spirit could take because I'm trying to get my mind renewed to the Christ that is in me. She's trying to become one person. She was divided before. We're all divided. We're, we go to church on Sunday and we're divided from what we do on Monday and, and our business divides us from our home and we're, we're divided individuals. We're not whole persons anymore. You go through life like that. Every once in a while you hit a point where everything seems to be working and then it falls apart. We take that as life. That's what life is. But Paul said, my joy is when you get in one accord. Oneness. First with yourself. Now, people that are in one accord with themselves can be in one accord with everybody else. That's what was wrong with this little lady I just told you about. She's a blessed soul, and I don't blame her for what she did. But when she finally gets in one accord with herself and gets that straightened out in her mind, who she is and who Christ is to her, then she can mix with anybody. She can mix with the devil. She can mix with the world. She can mix with sinners. She can mix with anybody anywhere because she now is one person, and that one person is Christ. It's Christ in her. It's Christ as her. She's Christ in a human form of who she is. It's Christ alive. She no longer lives. Christ lives in her. She's gotten that fixed. So just like Jesus could go into bad places, just like Jesus could go where the devil was, just like Jesus to go where death and sickness ruled and reigned, just like Jesus to go in their synagogues where they wanted to stone him and deal with the Jews, his own brethren who wanted to kill him, just like he could do that, so can you because you're one. You're not fragmented. You're not divided. You're not separated. You're one person. I can take it. But you don't have to take it all. But you can take it. Because the other side of it is Jesus went places and he ran away. He'd get in a crowd and he'd run off and leave them. He'd get in a boat and he'd go to the other side of the sea. He'd preach a great sermon and he'd run into the desert. You may not want to be with everything that happens in your life, all the people, all the relationships, but you're now one person. You're in one accord, and that's where the joy comes to the Lord when he sees us in oneness. And my joy is when I see people come into the fruit-bearing of this message. That's my greatest joy. It isn't that they do it through my ministry, because I'm seeing people now that God has led as deep, if not deeper, than any of us have come to from around the world because he's been teaching them. And that's my joy to see his message and his son vibrantly alive in human beings. So all that's in that second verse. That's what brings joy. We get our joy because we have one mind. We get our joy because we have one love. And we get our joy because we're in one accord. So let's read the third verse. Let's move on here. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now we're going to come to the introduction to the heart of this second chapter. I, I'd call this fourth verse the introduction. 
this introduction verse to this theme of this fourth uh, this second chapter, this fourth verse is the introduction verse to the theme of the chapter, let's say. Theme of the chapter is kenosis. And we'll get into that in the fifth verse. But this fourth verse is sort of the introduction to it, or I beg your pardon, the third verse. We're, we're ready to deal with the third and fourth verse. This is the introduction to the theme of the chapter, which is kenosis. We'll talk about that later. But before we go into it, he begins to deal with self. Let's read this third verse. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. So if you will, draw a line halfway between that last word, themselves. Just draw a line between the M and the S, them and selves and separate selves, because that's really what we've got to deal with now as we come into the most awesome subject of consecration in the whole of the scriptures, the awesome aspect of consecration and commitment. We've got to deal with self, and we've got to get it in focus if we're going to go into this. What it is, there has to be a human giving up in the area of self before we can come in to the deep commitments we make with God. Not after we make those commitments, but before we make that commitment, Paul does this. That's what's done in this third and fourth verse. In this third verse, he says, not esteem ourselves in any way. In the fourth verse, he says, look not on every man on his own things, but on every man uh, on every man on the things of others. Now, what he's dealing with here is what we see in ourselves. What we see in ourselves. I'm going to divide the theme of this chapter into two parts. First, what we see in ourselves, and then what Christ sees in himself. That's the way we want to divide this. So we want to deal with self first. First, we must make the regular statements that are always made when anybody talks about self. Because the first thing people think is, well, that means we've got to crucify ourselves. I don't know a verse of Scripture that says that. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. But I don't know a verse that says we've got to crucify self. Now, I believe the crucifixion of self has already taken place because Galatians 2.20 speaks in past tense. I am crucified, not I'm going to be, not I can be. I am crucified with Christ. And the theme of that has to be in Romans the 6th chapter. Now, if we were studying Romans the 6th chapter, we would see at least four times in the 6th chapter of Romans he says that our self died with Christ on the cross. Our old way of doing things is already dead. Our old self is dead with Christ. When Christ came out of the grave, there was a new self. That self was Christ as us. But the facts are, human beings go through life still trying to crucify themselves. And I know of no scripture for this. You do not crucify yourself. You don't kill out self. Why? There's nothing wrong with yourself. There never has been anything wrong with yourself. Yourself is a creation of God. That's what God created. Self is the creation of God that Jesus must operate through. The greatest problem we have when dealing with self is that we think we have to get rid of self. So I want to lay it out as plain as I possibly can. God never intended we get rid of ourselves. Our self is what Christ must have in order for him to be our life. He's got to have something to work through. He has no hands but our hands. He has no eyes but our eyes to see. No voice but our voice to speak. So you don't kill self. What do we do with self? Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment. Uh, we'll take our break right here. And we'll come back to this in just a moment. News. Now we're talking about the third and fourth verse of the second chapter of Philippians. 
these verses read, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not on every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now what we're being introduced to here is the subject of kenosis. And I think you need to have some feeling of uh, understanding of this term. It's not a term too often used in Christianity, but it's simply a term that means self-emptying. Osmosis means self-fulfilling or fulfilling. Kenosis means emptying. And we're going to deal with the term kenosis in two different ways in this in these next uh, several verses. And as I said a while ago, we're going to deal with kenosis first from the human side and then from the Christ side. Self-emptying. Self. Dealing with self. Now there's nothing wrong with self. You never crucify or kill self. The ways that self operates and the things that a self does was dealt with at the cross. We were not killed at, cross, at, at the cross. What was killed out at the cross is our old man. Our old man is a way of doing things, our old way of doing things. That's what was killed out at the cross. There was nothing wrong with yourself. Yourself didn't do wrong things, but it was that thing which misused yourself. What misused us? It was Satan. When Adam <coughs> believed what Satan said, then he took to himself another life, another God so to speak. We call it sin nature. He received a sin nature when he believed what Satan said. And from that point on, Satan misused the human being. So the self was turned into a Satan self. Now, you got to be careful how I use that. The lady said to me, that, does that mean that all sinners are demon possessed? Isn't what it means at all. Demon possession is something else. But a Satan self is what Satan did to human beings back in the Garden of Eden when Adam believed what the devil said and ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he took on another way of doing things. He took on another operator of his self. So until we accept Jesus as our Savior, we've got misuse of our self in operation. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, the old operator goes out and the new operator, Christ, comes in. It's an exchange of natures. That's what nature is. Nature is what it is that operates you. First, sin nature. Now that you're born again, you have a God nature. So what birthing is, is an exchange of natures. Well, there never was anything wrong with yourself. Just when Adam committed his, his rebellion against God and accepted Satan's ways, he took on someone who misfit his creation, Adam. Adam accepted Satan as his nature and that misfit his creation. He, from then on, no human being was ever normal. No human being is ever normal with Satan's nature in them. And so at the cross, we got rid of Satan's nature and gave God the right to put a God nature in us, Christ in us, and that's what it means to be born again. So. What it is, there's never been anything wrong with yourself. You've just been misused. But the problem with all of us is, and we're going to see that particularly when we get in the fifth verse here, is that we have been so misused by Satan that our minds don't know anything else but that. That's all we know. It's like if you lived in a dark room all your life, you'd like darkness better than light. If you had food that was destroying your body, when you ate other food, you couldn't stand it. Good food, you couldn't stand it. Because the way that you are bred and trained in life is what makes you think who you are. That's who you are. So we had Satan as a nature in us so long, we thought that's what we were. We thought we were bad, no good, something was wrong with ourselves. and the moment we come to God, what we want to do is get rid of ourselves. But there never was anything wrong with ourselves. God got rid of Satan. Now we must change our mind. 
we must have a renewal in our mind and understand what it is God has done for us. So in this third verse, he talks about kenosis. Kenosis is emptying ourselves of those things that's contrary to the Christ that's in us. Not destroying ourselves, but emptying self of those things that are contrary to the Christ that is in us. And there are two or three things that will help you to understand this. First, you get rid of selfishness. You don't get rid of self. You get rid of a self-effort called selfishness. That you have to wrestle with as a believer. Selfishness. Or you get rid of self-gratification. That the only thing that makes you you is when you do something that's you. That's self-gratification. If you do something good, it isn't you, it's Christ. If you accomplish a task, it wasn't you, it was Christ. You no longer live, Christ liveth in you. And so you change your idea, your mind about self. That's kenosis. You empty yourself of those feelings that I have to do this to be me. You empty yourself of selfishness. And you empty yourself of self-esteem. You've seen people walk around like it was with their nose up in the air. If it rained, they'd drown. Uh, people who just think they're something in somebody, they're nothing aside from Christ. They're a self that should have gone to hell, but God's decided to take Satan out and put Christ in it. There never was anything wrong with yourself. So the... The objective of Christian living is the believer who brings himself under subjection to the life of Christ, to the new life in Christ. That's your whole objective as a Christian. You have been misused until you saw Christ as your life. But now that you know Christ is your life, you bring yourself under subjection to his life, and now he begins to flow through you. The objective of Christianity is for Christ to flow through the human being spontaneously as sin nature did. When you have the Satan nature in you, you never stop to think, I got Satan's nature in me. I'm doing bad because Satan's nature. You didn't even think that way. You just spontaneously went ahead and lived by the nature that was in you. Now that you're born again, what God wants is for his children who he has birthed to go ahead and live spontaneously with the God nature in them. See? Not, not worried, not fretting about doing right, doing wrong, but just going ahead and living by the new nature that was in you, just like you did with the sin nature. Now you can live by the God nature. There's a whole other world of truth and subject to get into about spontaneous living by Christ in us. But this third verse and fourth verse introduces us to self-emptying, which is kenosis. A part of self-emptying is dealt with in verse 4 where he says to be concerned with the needs of others. Now, in our selfishness, with Satan operating through ourself, we never were interested in others. We were only interested in ourselves. Our only interest in others was if it benefited ourselves. Now, there are plenty of people living today who are interested in others, but it's because it fulfills or benefits them. I've met a lot of people in the world that are, that are given to orphanages and given to, to humanitarian works, and somebody gets in trouble, they'll just kill themselves trying to help them. But deep down, the only reason they do it is because it gives them self-esteem. See? Why? Because it isn't in the human being that has sin nature in them to do anything aside from they themselves becoming something of themselves. What did Satan say to Adam and Eve? The moment you eat of this fruit, you will be as God yourself. So the whole thing about unconverted people is that they only do what they do because it makes them something. Now that's a sad story because there's no way I can deliver that without saying that we have multitudes of believers who are no different. They're just as selfish. 
yet they have Christ in them. They have the God nature in them. Then why are they not giving? Why are they not interested in others? Simply they don't know Christ lives in them. They're saved. He's there. But if you don't know it, you're never going to express it. So that's the saddest part of Christianity. The saddest thing in Christianity is people who don't know who they are in Christ. That's the saddest thing, that they live and finally die and never know who they are in Christ. That's sadness. So in self-emptying, we get rid of our selfishness, our self-esteem, our self-gratification, and we become Christ in us becomes oriented toward others. We become interested in others because we sense that God has offsprings just like us everywhere. And we become interested in We're interested in the unconverted because we see that they're incompleted human beings without Christ in them. So a Christ in you person is a person that is oriented toward others. It's Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We love others even when they're wrong. It's Jesus who says he will give himself for others. That's us. But now this is the one side of kenosis, our kenosis, where we deal with self. Actually, you can do nothing about dealing with yourself. The way you deal with self is not aim at your problem and shoot it down. The way you deal with self is to see Jesus. Once again, you see Christ. The more you see Christ, the less selfishness there will be in you. With the knowledge that Christ is my life, the more you see him operating as your life, the less selfishness and self-gratification there is in you. It's, it's like a law. It's automatic. It's spontaneous. You begin to be given to others. But then in the fifth verse, this takes us into the Lord's kenosis, and we need to talk about that. In verse 5, Paul says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now he's saying, the way that self-emptying takes place, the way a kenosis takes place where you limit yourself voluntarily out of love, you limit yourself to be certain things. You limit yourself to be this Christ that is in you. He says that's a mind thing. We're getting down to the nitty-gritty now of Christianity. It's in the mind. The whole of God's working is in our thinking or in our mind. He's done the work of salvation. You're born again. That's done by Calvary. All you had to do is believe. But now that you believe, the whole of Christianity settles to be a mind thing. So he says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. The word mind in this fifth verse best translates to another word, disposition. What it really says is let the same disposition be in us that was also in Christ Jesus. You might write that right beside that word in your Bible, and then you would understand how it is you get the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ comes by disposition. What is your disposition about events and times and things that takes place in your life? How do you look at you? How do you look at others? How do you handle the circumstances and situations of life that you have? How do you look at them? How do you treat them? Your disposition toward them is your mind. That's what the mind is. The mind is the way you treat the circumstances and situations of life that you come in contact with. So what he says in this fifth verse, let this same disposition be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, do you ever think that you have the same disposition toward things that Christ has? Well, to be honest, most of us never even think like that. Sometimes we get all worked up and we say, well, I ought to do what Christ would do. But that you can't do. You can't be Christ. We can't be gods. We're not intended to be gods or Christ. But we can have his disposition. What is disposition? Disposition is the way we handle things. 
And the more you see Christ, the more you handle things according to the Christ that is within you. In Paul's writings, he speaks of the mind three different times. Here in Philippians 2 and 5, he says that we should allow the same disposition to be in us, same mind to be in us that was in Christ Jesus. Then again, in 1 Corinthians 2 and 16, he says, but you have the mind of Christ. You, the way it best translates is you have available the mind of Christ. You don't really have the mind of Christ. You may be growing into that. But you have available the mind of Christ. What does that mean? You have available by the reading of the word, by the searching of the scriptures, you have available to take on the same disposition towards circumstances and situations that Christ had. Now, I didn't say you'd handle them like Christ handled them. I didn't say you'd be Christ handling your circumstances and situations. I said you'd have his mind or you would have his disposition as to how to treat that. In other words, you'll treat it as you are, but you'll have in your mind fixed that now I need to be sweet, I need to be kind, I need to be loving, I need to be helpful. The same disposition that Christ had. Now you can't have that. Where do you get that disposition or mind? You get it from searching the scriptures. The more you study the scriptures and see how Jesus acted and reacted, the more your disposition will be that. It's like a spiritual law. It's because the Holy Spirit will constantly be reminding you and working on you concerning the Christ that is in you. Just remember, you can never be Jesus of Nazareth, but you can have his same disposition. That means you can handle a lot of things like he handled, handled them because you have the mind of Christ. But God doesn't expect you to be Christ and to handle everything just like he did at all times. He does say that you can have his disposition over it. That's Christ in us. Now there's one more verse of scripture where Paul deals with mind, and that's in Romans 12 and 2, where he says, Be not taken up with the things of the world, but be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that's the clinching verse that deals with mind in the epistles. That's the verse that really deals with it because that verse suggests that you may need this every day. You may need to renew your mind every day. In other words, you may need every day to be reminded by the Holy Spirit that your disposition isn't right. You ever get up in the morning, as we say, off the wrong side of the bed? You ever have your day to start out wrong? You ever have somebody to really upset you early in the day or sometime during the day? See, this is dealing with your disposition. You say, well, the real me had a right to be mad. No, the real you had a right to bring forth Christ like you are, his disposition. That's what you had a right to. Husbands and wives in dealing with each other only have a right to the disposition of Christ, the mind of Christ. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That verse says they're daily living in this world. Don't get taken up with the things in this world so that your mind isn't renewed because you, because you're living in the world and have so much of the world crashing in around you, you need daily to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, we've always put you to self-effort Christianity here. Well, you need to get up and pray in the morning. You need to read a chapter out of your Bible. You need to do this. You need to do that. No, what you need is to listen to the Holy Spirit. If you feel led to get up and pray and read your Bible, do it. If the Holy Spirit tells you to get up and pray and read your Bible, do it. <laughs> I used to jerk precious promises out every morning. And the Holy Spirit said to me one day, you're not getting truth that way. I'd take a promise because I'd stand on that promise, you know, and that was to give me a good disposition. But the Holy Spirit stopped me there and he said, you don't know what's said before that verse or after it. You're really plucking out something and coming to false understanding. So I kind of quit doing that. Now, don't throw away your precious promise box over that, but uh, uh, there was good sense in that. I want the disposition of Christ because I have Christ in me. He's going to come through me like I am. 
I need my mind renewed because the circumstances and situations of life can become so powerful, I forget. I can forget who and what I am in a difficult moment. So the Holy Spirit is there to teach me, to remind me, to quicken in me Christ. So we're not to get taken up with the world, but we're to be renewed in the spirit of our mind, as Romans 12 tells us. Now, that's all in that fifth verse where he says, let this mind, let this dispos disposition be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, what is his disposition? What is it that made Christ react to circumstances and situations like he did? It's because of his kenosis. What is kenosis? It's self-emptying. It's getting rid of everything that makes you a self within yourself. When you had Satan operating through you, he kept telling you that you were no good and you were bad. He made you think you were an independent self getting into trouble all on your own. But that was a lie. He lied to you. Over in uh, 1 John, uh, where is it, either 3rd, maybe the 5th chapter, John says that Satan was a sinner from the beginning. Wasn't you, it was Satan. You were misused. You were mishandled. Now God's put Satan out. He's put Christ in. And the Christ that is in you went through the same ordeal where he emptied himself. And we're going to read verses of the kenosis of Christ. Look at these verses. Where he emptied himself of what he was to take on his relationship to us. Look at his kenosis now. Beginning at the sixth verse, Christ being in the form of God. That word form is a big word. Uh, it's used several times in the scripture. I, I want to digress again to talk about Christ being in the form of God. What was it? He was God as the Son. He was God the Son. The Son of God was God the Son. He was God in Son form. You understand that? You know what you are? You are Christ in a human form. You're not Christ, but the Christ spirit is in you and manifests itself through you in a human form. Now be careful how you ever say that. Somebody will say, think you said you as Jesus Christ. We're not Jesus Christ. We're not God's, but we are manifestors of Christ spirit in a human form. Like Christ was in the form of God. Form. What's form? That's our creation. That's the part of us that's created. And there was a part of Christ that was created, and that was his body. That's what he got from Mary. He got body from Mary. That's what we get from mothers. They manufacture bodies. And so he was God in a human form. But uh, let's not dwell on that any longer. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now this... This, this is his kenosis. He was equal with God, and we allow that. We are Trinitarians. We believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all equal, that they are all an intricate part of God, one God manifesting himself in three distinctive persons, a great mystery to some, but understandable to those who have been birthed by this Father, for we begin to see and understand all that. Now, verse 7 begins his kenosis, though he's in the form of God. Verse 7 begins the theme of the kenosis. It says, but he made himself of no reputation. Who did that? He did that. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He was made by God in Mary's body in the likeness of man when he took on the form of humanity. And he was found as a man, in fashion as a man. He humbled himself as a man. He became obedient unto death as a man, even the death of the cross. Three powerful verse, sign verses signifying the kenosis of Christ his kenosis. The scriptures bear out seven different
steps of Christ emptying himself. Why is emptying necessary? Why did he take on the form of man? Because he had to show us that as a man, we could be pleasing to God, acceptable to God, saved by the power of Calvary as a man, we could become servants and sons of God. He took on being a man so that he would die as one of us and we would die in him. Seven different steps that Christ used to empty himself. You need to see these. First, he emptied himself of his deity. This is hard on some people because they really wrestle with this point. I try to make it simple. You could not kill a God. You could not kill eternal life. You could not kill the Creator. So he had to empty himself of his deity so that he could die, so that he could take on the form of man, so that he could bear our sin, so that sin could kill him. He emptied himself of his deity. Hanging on that cross, therefore, is not really God, but it's the Son of God bearing us. It is us as him and him as us. He emptied himself of his deity and took sinners into his very body so that Isaiah prophesied, prophesied that he bore in his body our own sins. That's that form. That's what he got from Mary. That's his likeness to man, that body. He bore in that body his sins, our sins. He had no sin. He bore in that body our sins and our transgressions. Number two, he emptied himself of his background, his training, and everything that made him who he was. Emptied himself of Mary. See, Catholicism could never accept his kenosis because he had to empty himself of being Mary's son of being special, of being great, of being important, of being raised in Nazareth, and identify himself with every sinner. He became our sin. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of Christ. He emptied himself of all his training, of all his background. When he hang on that cross, everything he had ever done meant nothing. The only thing that meant anything was that he was God's lamb. The fact that he had raised the dead and cleansed lepers meant nothing. The Jews hollered for him to come down from the cross when he hanged there because they said he's raised others from the dead. Why don't he save himself? He had taken on the form of humanity. He had become sin who knew no sin. That's his kenosis. He became a man. The scripture said he suffered in all ways like unto anybody else. He became a man in order that we might become him. He became us that we might become him, his life. Number four, he became a bond slave. Totally committed to God. Totally committed to God. He became a bond slave that he might show us the humbleness and the givingness that there must be in us in order to please God. And then the scripture said he humbled himself. He humbled himself. There's going to come a time in your life where you're going to have to humble yourself. And when you humble yourself, you're going to go against everything you believed, but you're going to humble yourself. You're going to violate the very law of your identity, but you're going to humble yourself because the Christ in you humbled himself to the death, 
of the cross. And that's the next thing it says. He became obedient to death. Obedient to death. Even the death of the cross. That's the seventh thing. Obedient to death. There's a difference between being willing to die and being willing to die on the cross. He emptied himself of any regal glory and power and majesty and might that he might die on the most unbelievable, disadvantaged, and ungodlike death that could be died the place where criminals were killed, the hill where the ungodly were killed, Golgotha, and hang upon a cross like a common criminal. He was obedient in his kenosis to the cross. They could have slipped him poison and let him die alone. They could have stoned him to death, but instead they held him ignominiously upon a cross the way the most common, filthy, unbelievable human beings were put to death. That was his kenosis. Why did he do that? To show the awfulness of sin and to show the power of God in resurrection. Because the more horrible the death, the more powerful the resurrection. The more unbelievable state he came to in his death, the more beautiful life he portrays in his resurrection. He became obedient to the cross. Christ that is in you has emptied himself of everything that would make him great. Therefore, Christ in you is not to make you great and wonderful and powerful. I was in a meeting uh, not long ago where a lady kept hollering, you must be an apostle, you must be an apostle. Finally, I stopped her and I said, lady, I want to be nothing but a son, and that's the highest position you can have, a son of God. He that is in me seeks no position, seeks no place except to be one with the Father. His ultimate prayer was, as I'm one with the Father, so do I want you to be one with me. That's all he's ever wanted. All God's ever wanted is somebody to love him. All Christ asks is that you be one with him, for he's in perfect harmony with the Father. Well, we're going to stop right there because the next verse, ninth verse, takes us into lordship, and that's a whole different subject. Sort of in the same vein, but a different subject, and we'll not bite it off right now. <coughs> I just have to tell you this is about the best group I've ever seen here. God love you. You've been good tonight. God bless you. Reach over and take your neighbor by the hand. Can you do that? Just take your neighbor by the hand and kind of look him in the eye and say, I see Jesus in you. Hallelujah. I see Jesus in you. Praise the Lord. In your life. Amen. I see Jesus in me. In me. I see Jesus in me. In me. In my life and all that I do. I see Jesus in me. Praise the Lord. That's it, folks. If you keep seeing Jesus, it'll all work out. God bless you till we get together the next time.